Good morning, Chapel family. Uh, I'm so excited this morning. We are going to continue our series through the book of Leviticus. Uh, This morning, I'm actually on my way down to a church planter conference in uh, Florida. And so just finished up a pastoral writing retreat as well. And so I just wanted to thank you all for your generosity as a church for uh, allowing uh, me to take part in stuff like this. And I can't wait to uh, bring back and and introduce and implement what I'm learning at this conference this upcoming week. But this morning, I'm so excited because we're going to have Pastor Rex Howe uh, bring the message to us as we talk about the Day of Atonement and kind of get to the summit of the mountain that is Leviticus. But before I introduce him, I do have to say I heard about the results for the chili cook-off. I want to assure you all there was no rigging in the voting, Um, but I think next year we might want to implement a rule that there's no campaigning by the one who who, uh, made the chili. So, uh, but no, that's that's fun and all. But this morning I do want to introduce uh, Pastor Rex Howe. Uh, He is the president of Tri-State Bible College. Uh, He enjoys time with his family and local church life, golf, writing, reading, woodworking, and tinkering in his garage. Uh, Pastor uh, Rex, he graduated from Tri-State Bible College, uh, which is in South Point, Ohio, the most southern part of the state of Ohio, in 2006, uh, and then went on to go to uh, Dallas Theological Seminary with an emphasis in New Testament studies, where he graduated in 2011. And he's currently uh, completing his PhD studies at the University of Aberdeen, which is in Scotland, uh, in the School of Divinity, History, and Philosophy, where his his, his research focuses on what's called the Nomina Sacra, in the extent of the New Testament manuscripts and the first four centuries in early Christian pneumatology, which is uh, the study of the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, He's a former youth pastor, uh, former assistant pastor down in Dallas, and he served as a senior pastor at West Lisbon Church from 2015 to 2020, and now uh, he serves as the sixth president of Tri-State Bible College. On top of that, Pastor Rex is a huge Bengals fan. Uh, He wrote that in here, so I had to say it. Um, I wonder if I should bleep that out. But anyway, I'm so excited to have him bring the word this morning. And so uh, as we prepare to hear our, uh, as we prepare our hearts to hear from the book of Leviticus, uh, uh, we were actually going to read from Hebrews chapter nine for our scripture reading. I'm just going to read a few verses here. Hebrews chapter nine, starting in verse one, it says, now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence, it's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Verse 6. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second only the high priest goes, and only he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, 
but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Would you join me in welcoming Pastor Rex Howe to bring the word this morning? Oh, good morning, Chapel. It's great to be with you. I have loved being with you so far. I have felt loved uh, all morning. Um, It's been uh, love since I've walked in the door. Uh, Thank you so much for your your greeting and your warm hospitality to my wife, to my wife Amy, who's over here to my to my left, and to me. Uh, it's been wonderful to get to know Pastor Chase. We have a DTS connection. Hi, Amanda. I just saw you there. Uh, she's got our t-shirt. She's got our shirt on. That's great. Um, so I have just had a great time getting to know Chase. We weren't at DTS at the same time, but um, if you're listen, if you're a DTS person, there's just the family immediately from the common experience. And so we sent. Thank you for the song this morning. All hail the power of Jesus' name. And as we start today, I didn't plan this, but I just want to share. A blessing that I'm sure uh, maybe you're familiar with and it comes from number six and it says the Lord bless you and I pray this over the chapel Uh, the Lord bless you the Lord strengthen you and the Lord guard and protect you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and the idea there is that the Lord has turned his mercy and his grace upon his people and may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and the idea is that the Lord would fill you with his joy and his Shalom, his holiness, his peace. And then at the end of that blessing, the Lord says, so, so shall they put my name upon the people. And we sang about the name of Jesus this morning. We sang about crown him and all hail the power of Jesus' name. And brothers and sisters, do you know that if you are in Christ this morning, that his name is like a banner over your life? And that banner is, is, is marching with you over your life, chapel, chapel family. And so I pray that blessing as we begin this morning. Um, I love to read about Mount Everest. Um, I don't always have the freedom to read about Mount Everest right now because I am in PhD studies, so a lot of my reading is ancient Greek manuscripts and pneumatology from early church writers, but I do love to read about Mount Everest. I read a book by Mick Conifree called Everest 1953 several years ago, and it just was one of my favorite historical event reads. Um, He tells the epic story of the first ascent up to the Great Mountain Summit. And according to December 2020 measurement, the daunting Everest, which is locally called Komo Lungma by the Tibetans and Sagar Matha, I hope I'm saying that right, by the Nepali people, it stands at 29,032 feet. 29,032 feet above sea level. The summit team of 1953 was preceded by decades of attempts. Nations founded the great mountaineering societies to conquer Everest. The political jostling that surrounded the expeditions is almost as interesting as the, reading the stories of the summit attempts. For example, Tibet banned attempts to climb between 1925 and 1932. There was just too much political jostling going on, so they, clo- they shut it down. Many people invested time into planning, technological developments, strategizing pathways up the mountain. Do we go this way or that way? Equipment gathering, base camp planning, checkpoint mapping, and team building all took place prior to the first steps of an expedition into and onto the mighty mountain. Once on the mountain, the teams found themselves surrounded by dangers and threats on all sides. Bitterly cold temperatures, blizzards, sickness, fall risks, ice faces, oxygen depletion, and more. Perhaps even more paralyzing, there were reminders and evidences all along the way up that mountain that it had a reputation for conquering the climbers. Who could climb such a mountain? In 1952, John Hunt and his team made preparations for a summit attempt. The stakes were high. In June 1953, the British Empire would coronate their new regent, Queen Elizabeth II. John Hunt's team was scheduled to summit one month later, a coronation gift for the new monarch. 
Everest was and remains difficult to access. However, history shows us that it is not impossible. One source claims that there have been over 4,000 successful summiters up Everest. That's quite a few, right? Would you think it would be that many? Over 4,000? As we turn our attention to Leviticus this morning, we want to speak of another daunting mountain. Amen? Um, I'm going to be honest with you. As I've followed the chapel online for the recent weeks in Leviticus, Leviticus and, and listened to Chase's exposition through the book, and then y- y'all have entrusted me. You know, in Southern Ohio, we say Ewans. I don't know if that's... But Ewans have entrusted me. That's y'all plus three, and for those who don't... <laughs> you have entrusted me with Leviticus 16. I mean, you guys have been building up to this for weeks. And it's daunting. And I'll be honest, there's a little bit of fear and trembling in my bones right now. But we want to speak about this daunting mountain, not because of its height, not because of sinking temperatures, not because of insufficient oxygen, but because of its holiness. Brothers and sisters, I, want to, I, I pray that we feel the holiness of today the Day of Atonement. The one day a year that the high priest, only him, and with blood, was allowed to enter into the most holy place, into the presence of the living God. It's holy because of the one who dwells there, the one true and living God. The God revealed in the Holy Scriptures is the one God who eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's where he made his presence known in ancient Israel. The psalmist in Psalm 24 asked, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The psalmist in Psalm 34, verse 4, writes, Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Who, what is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. Brothers and sisters, we are textually entering into the most holy place this morning. the most holy place in ancient Israel, but we will even go beyond that this morning into the holy place not made with human hands. Not the shadow, not the copy of the tabernacle, but the place where the Son and the only divine Son has entered in glory in heaven. So we want to review just a little bit uh, with our theme in Leviticus, we, as we begin to formulate who can ascend the mountain of the Lord, we want to take a moment, just review where Pastor Chase has led us thus far. Can we do that? Uh, the theme of Leviticus is that it paints a vibrant picture of the holiness of God, the severity of sin, the love of Jesus, and our need to live for him. As we, as we come to the Day of Atonement, we're going to see all of these things merge. We're going to feel the holiness of God because of just the the minutia of the detail it takes to enter the space. We're going to feel the severity of sin because there's this separation that can only be pierced and penetrated at this very (laughs) precise moment. And we're going to feel the love of Jesus, brothers and sisters, because when Jesus died on the cross, something happened. The scriptures tell us that from the top down to the bottom, a veil was torn asunder, giving us access to the love of Christ on the cross. And we'll also see here today our need to live for him. What does this mean? What does this mean that this way has been opened up for us? What does it mean that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one has access to the Father except through him? How does that change me now? There's a holiness for me to live in accordance with now. So we want to live for God. Why should we study this book? Well, Chase has told us that we believe that all Scripture is from God. And this is what the Scriptures say. 2 Timothy 
tells us this. We are reading the Word of God, whether we are reading Ezekiel 40, verse 18, which says, And the pavement ran along the side of the gates, corresponding to the length of the gates. This was the lower pavement. That's inspired from God. Isaiah 53, 5 was also inspired. God breathed words, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. You see, all of the scripture is inspired by God. Second, studying Leviticus unlocks greater illumination in other parts of scripture. Pastor Chase read for us um, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. And you can already see, for just the short time you've been in Leviticus, some of that language is already there that Hebrews talks about. So the, the more you know the message of Leviticus, the more you understand Hebrews. The more you understand what Jesus is living in and among when he was here in his incarnational life. You understand the setting of Scripture. Third, Leviticus will cause us to love God deeper and to hunger for his holiness. I mean, I, I really... I really think that, this is me personally, that the access and grace that we've experienced in Jesus is so free that sometimes, sometimes, I take it for granted. And holiness is lesser of a priority, if I'm honest. And so I think that Leviticus is the type of book that recalibrates that, reorients us to who is God and who am I and what has he done for me and how does that affect my life? And finally, and I've added this one for today, when studied carefully, Scripture bears witness to eternal life in Jesus Christ. Let me read John chapter 5, verse 39 to you. Listen to what this says. Jesus is uh, in one of his conversations with the religious leaders of his day, and here's, here's what he says to them. He says, You search the Scriptures... Because you think that in them you have eternal life. You see, they were mistaken. They thought that the goal of the Bible was the Bible. And here's here's how he corrects them. You think that you have eternal life in them. And it is they that bear witness about me. You see, the goal of Scripture is to take you to Jesus. And so when we come to Leviticus, we should be asking the question, how does this tell me the old, old story about Jesus Christ and his love. Amen? And so, when when studied carefully, Scripture always bears witness to the eternal life that's in Jesus Christ. Now, what even is Leviticus? And and Chase has taken us through this as well. The whole book of Leviticus is a shadow of the cross. It's, if we're up on this summit, we imagine uh, the Day of Atonement casting a shadow both before and after. Uh, and, And really, when we think of the cross... And we, and we think of the shadow of the cross. It, it spreads to the Old Testament and touches Leviticus in the Day of Atonement. And it spreads forward and touches the whole life of the church and eternity. We live under the shadow of the cross. We can learn so much about Jesus by understanding the system that he came to fulfill. The outline of the book that Pastor has given us is that 1 through 15 is about worship before God. Chapter 16 is about atonement before God. And then the final section, chapter 17 through 27, are about personal holiness before God. If you're new this morning to the chapel, um, welcome. Uh, If you're online watching, welcome. Uh, We've been in this journey. I've been online myself for the past few weeks. But we come to a very exciting passage today in the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. There are a number of offerings that might be helpful um, to be aware of, but remember we're on top of Mount Leviticus today. Uh, Scholars have shown that Leviticus 16 is not only the central revelation of the book of Leviticus, but it's also the central revelation of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Remember, Pentateuch means five books. So uh, we're right at the center. And again, fear and trembling today. So I'm thinking, Pastor Chase, why did you give me this passage to preach on today? (laughs) Because it's just so crucial to the whole study. The function of this chapter is yet another way that Leviticus helps us unlock Scripture, particularly the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the center of Leviticus. It's the center of the law. So much more so is the full and final atonement of the cross of Jesus Christ, the center of all Scripture and all history. 
I had a friend, we were exercising the other day, and he was witnessing to someone who's not in the faith, and he was, it was a coworker of his. He said, now, now come on, you have to admit something happened, right? Something happened with this Jesus guy. You have to admit that at least something happened. He was like, well, you know, I don't know. He said, okay, so what date did you put on your check? Well, you know, 2022. Well, something happened 20, 2,022 years ago that made you put 2022 on your check. So you're affected by it whether you believe it or not. So this guy is the center of history. You can study him from above and you can study him from below. And you're going to get the same answer that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Lord and Savior, the one and only begotten. As we stand at the summit today, we want to look back briefly at how we got here. We want to take in the fully the activity of all that happens on the summit, the Day of Atonement. And then we want to begin to look ahead at the descent of a life that has experienced the summit. Now, these offerings, Chase, uh, Pastor Chase has mentioned these offerings. This was a few weeks ago. Uh, but significantly, in this chapter, the burnt offering will be brought up. And remember, this is a wholly consumed offering. It's a voluntary offering. Uh, and then also the sin offering, which is one that is brought, it's mandatory. Um, and sometimes the sin offering was for, uh, for unintentional sins, and there was another offering for intentional sins. But these two offerings will play a prominent role in the activities and instructions in Leviticus chapter 16. So uh, the subject of the text today, the biblical subject, is the cleansing of the house of God. Now, this was something I learned through my study today, um, that in Leviticus 16, the house of the Lord must be cleansed. This is, we'll see this develop. It's not just the people's sins that need cleansed, but the house needs cleansed as well. The cleansing of the house of the Lord um, so that the people could be near to the life of God. And we'll, we'll think about how Leviticus 10 Actually, we can do that now. Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 3. Let's look there and remind ourselves of what happened in Leviticus 10. Something very important happened that speaks to the need for which the house of the Lord needs to be cleansed. And you'll remember this. So in Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 3, the scriptures say this. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. I will be set apart as holy. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That is, he was silent. So remember, this happened. Nadab and Abihu thought that they could enter the holy place at any time and in any way with anything they wanted with regard to incense. And they soon learned that that was not allowed. You cannot just rush in to the presence of the Lord the way that you want. And so chapters 11 through 16 are, okay, what happened and how can we enter in without that happening. And when we come to the beginning of chapter 16, we find that Nadab and Abihu, are, that theme is brought up again. And the need in the text is this. Aaron's sons presumed that they could penetrate the presence of God within the Holy of Holies any time. This is the need, and that's not allowed. So the question then begs is, well, how? What do we, what do, we do? Because we don't want that to happen again. So the purpose in Leviticus 16, and this comes from Morales and who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? Leviticus 16 offers for the first time uh, in Torah for the how and when and who of entering the Holy of Holies. This is the first time in Scripture that we're given the details. So our idea from the text this morning, the textual theme, is that the Lord revealed through Moses to Aaron a day of atonement for entry into the divine presence. The day of the atonement is the answer. Here's how. Here's who. And here's when. And so let's first look at the who, the supervisors for the Day of Atonement. In chapter 16, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. So the Lord is speaking. The Lord, remember, the Lord is the subject and the object in the book. He's the one speaking, and he's the one being worshipped. 
So he's the, he's the beginning and the end of the book. So the Lord uh, initiates, he speaks to Moses. Moses is his prophet. He spe- he's like a mouthpiece for the Lord. And he communicates to Aaron what must happen on the Day of Atonement. And the context he's, is given there, the two sons of Aaron. So we're bringing chapter 10 back into chapter 16 as a reminder. Remember what happened. Here's how things must be done on the Day of Atonement. So um, next we see the what, the threat concerning entrance into the holy place on the Day of Atonement in verses 2 and 3. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time. So this is, this is the danger. Uh, Nadab and Abihu were confused, thought they could come in at any time. You can't come in at, in at any time. So tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. So there's the threat. There's the warning. And he explains, the Lord explains, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So why can't he just come in at any time? Because the Lord is there. And one of the things I think that sometimes I have a difficult time with, maybe you share this, is that I have a tendency to want to just do things my own way. You know? I read a Pew Forum study about um, religious perspective and faith perspective of Ohioans. Okay? I'm born and raised Ohioan. My wife's an Ohioan. I don't know if y'all are all Ohioans or not, but there's, there's a Pew Forum study on every state in America. And one of the things that's very evident as you look at all those statistics is you've got about 60-some percent who believe there is a God, some who think, you know, maybe there's a God, some who think, no, there isn't a God. And then you have about 70% who pray pretty regularly, then you have a real hard drop when it comes to religious participation in a worship service or a Bible study or something like that. Real hard drop. I pray, but I don't go. Um, and then you have, as the, as, the, as the stats rolled out, as I was reading all these stats, they were just fluctuating up and down. You know what? I, my summary was like, we just do what we want. This is, this is the summary. We just do what, whatever floats my boat religiously, that's what I do. That is not how we can approach the holy place. And brothers and sisters, even as we think in the advancement of biblical revelation, you must come through Jesus. There is no other way. He is the mercy seat. We'll talk more about that later. He is the holy place. And so, what we see right here in the text is the threat concerning entrance into the holy place. Aaron should not go into the Holy of Holies any time he wishes. Aaron may not come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat. Why? Because God is there. You have to sanctify the presence of the Lord. And then we get into the meat of the chapter. And you'll notice proportionately verses about the second half of verse 3 all the way through verse 28 and that should speak to us as bible students if we're bible readers and uh, i'm like well what's the most important thing here in this chapter well the the time spent detailing it tells you what is most important and the time spent here are these roughly 25 verses of how how the administration of the day of atonement here's how it must be done And so the first thing we see is the collection of the priest's offering in verses 3 and 4. Aaron has to bring offerings. Uh, He has to bring a bull for a sin offering. He has to bring a ram for uh, for a burnt offering. Uh, He has to dress a certain way in verse 4. There's specific garments he must wear. And then later he's going to have to change his garments as as things kind of shift into a different, uh, when he does the uh, burnt offerings, I believe. And so... Uh, We see the the collection of the priest's offerings. We also see the collection of the people's offerings uh, in uh, in verse 5. The people must bring offerings. And this this is noticeable that the priest must bring offerings and the people must bring offerings in verse 5. Uh, They must bring two male goats for sin offering. They must also bring one ram for a burnt offering. Thirdly, the day of atonement 
for the house of the Lord of the priest's household by a sin offering. So the atonement first, uh, the first atonement made in, uh, in verses, verse 6, and then this is explained in detail in verses 11 through 14, is for the house of the Lord on behalf of the priest. Look at verse 6. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. So it's, it's for his, his household. But in verse 11, it says, Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself and he shall take a censer of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small and he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense uh, on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat so uh, the Lord's presence is surrounded by the cloud the incense creates uh, the mercy seat is surrounded uh, the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die and he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his fingers on the front of the mercy seat on the east side and in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times now uh, so this offering is understand for a year because the day of atonement is every year for a year the people and the priests have been bringing offerings sin offerings burnt offerings uh, peace off all these offerings and so the idea is that throughout the year, the people's sins have just kind of contaminated the house. And the Day of Atonement was a time when the house was cleansed. And then, and then we'll get to it later, but then an offering was made for the people as well. And so uh, the priest goes first. And then uh, the fourth thing we see is the separation of the goats. We have one goat is, is taken for a sin offering. Uh, verse 7 uh, and then one goat is left for uh, the expiation or the scapegoat uh, now there's a lot of uh, scholarly insight on I don't know what your Bible says my Bi I have the English standard version in verse 8 and Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel does anybody else have anything else what do your Bible say right there Azazel or something else scapegoat wilderness scapegoat okay so there's a lot of if you were to read on this, you'd find lots of opinions. What does this Hebrew word Azazel mean? Some people think it means uh, just a place out in the wilderness. Some people think it does have etymo etymological connection to the word for scapegoat. Other people think that it refers to some demonic figure out there uh, in the wilderness that lives, like the source of where chaos comes from, basically the devil. Um, that uh, he's the source of chaos, so you're kind of sending sin back to the source in a sense. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with scapegoat in the wilderness, you know, I'm comfortable with that, but uh, that's a fun coffee talk conversation, you know, whenever you want to do that. But the goats have to be separated. Um, one, one is sacrificed as a sin offering, the other uh, is part of this expiation or sin elimination ritual where the high priest puts his hands and confesses the sin over the goat, the sins of the people and his own sins over the goat, and then the goat is led out into the wilderness. The sins are taken away. So you have the separation of the goats. Fifth, the atonement for the house of the Lord of the people of Israel by a sin offering. So this is the second. The priest offers a sin offering for the house of the Lord, and then the people have a sin offering. For the house of the Lord, the one goat. And uh, number six, the atonement as entrance. So this is where uh, really things start to take take off for the, the where the offering is made for the house of the Lord. Verse 16. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place. That is these things that he has done, both on his own behalf, his ha his household's behalf, the people's behalf, thus, or therefore. He shall make atonement. This is how he has made atonement for the holy place. Because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. That is, the house has to be purified. Okay. So that's sort of stage one of the day of atonement. The cleansing of the house. And then seventh, we see the goat, which we've already talked about, the scapegoat, uh, in verse 
21, Aaron lay, shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel. Now, brothers and sisters, think about this. A year's worth of sins for the whole people. This is why it's called the day. Of it. it took, how much time did it take to confess all the sins that, of the people and of the priests that you could remember? Brothers and sisters, do we take confession seriously? You know, the Lord, the Lord tells us through his apostle in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. There's fellowship with God. He's faithful to forgive. He wants you to agree with him. This is what confession is. It's agreement with God that we have sinned. And that, and that is what restores fellowship. It's not, confession is something that, that continues fellowship with the Lord. It's, not, it's something that's perpetual. It's not like our, our one-time salvation forgiveness, but confession is something that maintains fellowship with our God. And so that's what's happening here. Um, and so uh, the, the priest confesses sins on the head of the goat, and then the goat is taken out to the wilderness. And, and remember, you know, uh, well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, let me get through the steps. The, 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 so the confession and elimination of sins of Israel to the wilderness, there's such an image here. We'll get to that. I just, I'm too excited about it. Uh, there's an image here of the sins going out into the wilderness. Then number eight, the atonement for the priest and the people on the altar by the burnt offerings. Remember, the burnt offerings are wholly consumed, and they're voluntary offerings. So you have the mandatory offering, cleanses the house, and then the people come and say, Lord, take me, consume me. I want to be holy for you. This, is, this follows the cleansing of the house. Now, Lord, I offer myself, I offer this offering to be wholly consumed by you and for you. What a all my sins have been forgiven. Lord, I am yours, wholly devoted. The priests, the people, the rams are burnt up. And then finally, there's the maintenance of cleanliness. So those who were involved in the, in the service, the one who took the goat out to the wilderness, and, and the ones who have to uh, carry out the, the, the carcasses of the sin offering, they have to bury them and burn them and all, all, the, uh, burn them and all this uh, they have to maintain cleanliness because we just had the day of atonement. We have, to, we have to be clean. And so when did this all happen? In verses 29 and 31, we find that the orbit of the day of atonement or, or the cycle, an orbit's like a cycle, a pattern, a habit. It was the seventh month, and it was the tenth day of the seventh month, and it was called a Sabbath of Sabbaths, requiring a special setting apart. This is the Sabbath on which the people would fast. They normally did not fast on the Sabbath, but on this Sabbath, they must fast. They must afflict themselves. And they had to cease from labor. And why? Why? What's the goal of the Day of Atonement? Verses 32 and 34. The scriptures say to us, And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement, wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly, and this shall be a statute forever for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. Because of all their sins, there must be an atonement, a covering, a satisfying, and an eliminating of the sin. Why? Because the Lord dwells in their midst. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. And so we get the why. The holy God must be approached by a sanctified people. He must have a sanctified sanctuary. The holy God must dwell among a clean and sanctified people. The holy God is eternally holy, so this sanctification ritual must be perpetual. The Holy God commanded the annual day of atonement for approaching the divine presence because of the accumulating, polluting sins of the people. Now, a little memory device for you. So bull, we see the word bull a lot in these sacrifice, sacrificial passages, right? So bull stands for blessing under Levitical law. All right, you ready for this? 
blessing under Levitical law. Then you have goats. If you notice the outline spelled goats upward, goal, orbit, administration, T, threat, and supervisors, right? Okay, goats. Here you go. God offers atonement to sinners. Amen. Everybody praise the Lord. God offers atonement to sinners. And then rams reversing Adam's miserable separation, <laughs> right? So... <laughs> Blessing under Levitical law, God offers atonement to sinners, reversing Adam's miserable separation. Amen? Because theologically, brothers and sisters, this is what is happening. There's a reversal happening in this day. Um, the actions, and here's the theological tension. The actions of Nadab and Abihu, anaphorically, and all that word means is to look backwards, anaphorically alludes to the expulsion from Eden. You catch this? When Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden, guess what was set at the entrance? To what? Cherubim, right? Angels. You know what was on the temple veil? To cherubim. So when Nadab and Abihu tried to go in, what happened? You can't, you can't just come in here. And so it was a reminder of Eden, what had happened, the separation that had taken place. And the purpose, I think, theologically, is to foreshadow a reversal of Edenic expulsion. The Day of Atonement teaches us that, you know what? God hasn't abandoned us. God is capable, God is capable of reversing what happened at Eden. He does so, he, he shows us at the Day of Atonement, he's capable of, of reversing the situation and giving access to his presence. And brothers and sisters, when we get to Jesus, it's fully reversed. There's, there's, just, there's access for any person, any tribe, any language, any tongue, all over the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the truth, the theological truth that we gain from Leviticus is that God's program will permanently provide re-entry into his divine life and presence through sanctification, not by shadows, not by copies, but by the substance of his son. Praise the Lord. There's so much I could go into, but I don't have time right here. I've got, I've got like another page of notes, but I don't have to skip on down, brothers and sisters. Let me, let me, let me show some themes here. In Leviticus, you have these, these back and forth between sin and holiness, right? Sin and holiness, death and life, chaos and presence and order actions affecting those directions defilement versus sanctification when you're defiled you go down to the grave to Sheol and when you're sanctified you you get closer and closer to the presence of the living God and so uh, boy I wish I had a week of coffee with y'all because I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to scoop so I, I think I have a picture of a strategic plan here do I have that picture um, yeah, so this is our strategic plan for our school. Um, it, isn't it pretty? It just isn't it so pretty, the strategic plan? I mean, all the detail. I'm an order guy. I love to see charts and things on paper. I'm like, this is clear. This is so clear. I feel good about this. But it doesn't matter unless we do it. Right? Just a piece of paper. Doesn't matter unless we do it. And so when we, when we read Leviticus 16, it's like, all oh, these instructions, so clear. But if Israel doesn't do it. Matter of fact, I was on a plane ride with a brother, not a brother, uh, with, with an acquaintance. His name's Josh. He's, he's a conservative Jew, young man. Um, he was very curious about my Christianity, and we talked for an hour. And I've come to find out that you know, what does a Jewish person do without the temple? You know, that's always a question. And what he said is, on the Day of Atonement every year, what they do is they have a sincere time of confession and repentance and make commitments to God with regard to a holy life. But there's no blood. And so I use that opportunity to talk about how Jesus is the Lamb of God. And that confession and repentance are surely things that we practice as Christians. But I have the assurance of salvation because of the blood of the once and for all given Lamb of God. I don't need another day of atonement. 
And so brothers and sisters, when we uh, think about today, let's, let's pivot a little bit and talk about today. A permanent human re-entry into the divine life and presence. A better atonement than bulls and goats has been offered. Um, Psalm 40, let me read this. And Will, if you want to go ahead and come up. Psalm chapter 40 says this to us, verses 6 through 8. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin... This is in the Old Testament, y'all. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will. O oh my God, your law is, writ is within my heart. You know, who, you know who Hebrews puts this on the lips of? Jesus. Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews puts this psalm on the lips of Jesus because, listen, it wasn't all the bulls and goats that God wanted, that God needed. It was to teach about one who would come. It was to teach us about our sinfulness. It was to teach us about the holiness of God. It was to teach us that we needed a final and full atonement. And the writer of Hebrews puts these words on the lips of Jesus in the book of Hebrews. Because Jesus, under, the Son understands what the Father wants. Someone to do His will. Perfectly fulfill the law of God. And that's what Jesus came and did. He perfectly lived an obedient life. He was the faithful Son of God. He gave His life on the cross. He nailed the debt, our debts, to the cross. He nailed the certificate of demands, the law, onto the cross. And He fulfilled every last one, fully and finally. And then he took his life up again, resur resurrected from the dead, and gives us the Holy Spirit that we might walk in the spirit of the law. We needed a better atonement to establish this human reentry into the do divine life and presence. And brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful to be able to say to you today, this morning, that we can receive this sanctification by the life and blood of God's Lamb, Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. Let me pray. Our Father, oh Lord, I think of the prayer that, um, that Paul prays for the Ephesians in chapter 3. That as, uh, oh God, that the prayer is for every, every family on earth. God, you know every family on earth. And that the Holy Spirit by His power desires to create a space within us a permanent dwelling for Jesus Christ our Lord to dwell and the reason that that dwelling is carved out that you give that kind of that kind of life and presence from you to us the life and presence of your son in us through your spirit is so that we might comprehend the breadth and the height and the width and the length of your vast love God that's it. That we might comprehend your love for us. Oh, how you love us, God. That to you be all the glory and honor and dominion and rule, Lord. Thank you for the atonement of Jesus Christ, your Lamb. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, and Nordonia, please go to our website at thechapel.life.